women seem to marry men that make the same as their brother. Um, uh, but there is changes in selection into marriage and the role of marriage in reproducing inequality. So let me show um, the marriage results. So this is marriage by father's income rank by gender. Um, and you can see that, you know, in this early period, uh, it's a bit, if anything, it's negative for women. So that means the richer your father were, was, the less likely you were to be married for these cohorts born in, in 1910. And then, um, and then basically in, in the post uh, 50s and 60s, you kind of see the correlation between marriage and father's income go up for both men and women. So it's like basically, you know, marriage is increasingly like something that's associated with coming from a richer, uh, with a with a richer, from a richer family. Um, and then that turns out not to matter very much for men. So if you look at the differences in the intergenerational correlations by married, but like all men versus married men, it doesn't really change very much at all. So it's just like, you know, it doesn't seem that marriage is a, a, a you know, selection to marriage doesn't seem to be altering the patterns of intergenerational mobility uh, for men, but for women, and you know, this is still noisy and you couldn't statistically distinguish this, you, you do see this like uh, divergence in intergenerational uh, uh, correlations between all women and married women. And where the, for married women, um, you know, there seems to be a lower correlation with father's income, of household income with father's income in terms of youth. Uh, 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 somewhat less. So we think that's interesting and kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's, there's been a lot of stuff, a, a lot of results um, made out of like, oh, has a sort of, uh, has a sort of marriage increased over time. But, you know, if you think about this uh, rank rank correlation, it's, it's, you, I think a lot of what is in the assortative marriage stuff is just that women are entering the labor force. And are making a lot of are making more money, and so now you're seeing this correlation between husbands' income and women and 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 wives' income. But if you thought about looking in a stable way at the correlation between uh, a, a woman's father's income and the income of her husband, that looks like it was much higher in the past. Um, um, <clears throat> okay, the 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 next thing is decomposing by race and an important i think an important contribution of our project is the inclusion of non-white respondents and there's a general sense in both economics and sociology that black and white mobility differences have persisted over long periods and these mobility differences are important it means that even if you uh, if you believe that there's a stable mobility difference between blacks and whites then it means that even if you like temporarily compress the uh, racial income gap It'll reemerge intergenerationally because uh, the the black household the 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 black families will have kids that do worse for a given level of income than uh, white families, and so then you'll see the reemergence of racial inequality even if you compress it in one uh, in 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 one in one generation. And so this is kind of a, an assumption used, for example, in Chetty et al. in their recent race and intergenerational mobility paper. Um, and so one, one thing our, our paper lets us, our data lets us do is look at this across uh, uh, over time and examine if it's in fact the case that racial mobility has been constant over time. So this is um, black white catch up. So uh, this is the, the correlation between father's income and kids income for white respondents born between 1910 and 1929. And then this is adding the, the, the black respondents. And you can see that the black respondents have like just kind of, you know, it's a similar slope, but the level is much lower. Uh, uh, African-Americans are generally poorer um, in, in uh, uh, particularly in this period. Um, and then when you look at the 1940 to 1959 cohorts, you see the, for the white population, you see a flattening. So there's less of a correlation with father's income for the white population. But then what's happening for the black population is just they're increasing in levels. So they're just getting like absolutely richer. And you, it's not really much of a change in the slope for the black for, for the black respondents. So a question you can ask is whites, you know, what we're seeing here is that whites flattened their slope. So there was like a, a reduced correlation with father's income for 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 whites, but blacks gained in absolute levels. And so what you can do is um, ask which one mattered more for the overall change in intergenerational mobility. 
So what we do is, um, uh, I think we were proud of ourselves for coming up with this, so we're <laughs> showing it. But basically, what uh, what what you can show is that you can like decompose the intergenerational mobility coefficient into like a weighted average of the subgroups uh, that uh, of their um, intergenerational mobility, and then like kind of the between group covariance of the of the subgroup averages. So what this is saying is that you can think of the overall intergenerational mobility as sort of a, the intergenerational mobility of each group sort of weighted by their by the income uh, uh, the variance of income of their of their of their dads plus just the income differences across groups how much the cross group the cross group correlation of the average incomes of the groups with their with their with their dads uh, with the dad's average income so importantly like equalizing the the just the absolute differences between groups will re will reduce this between group covariance even if there's not very much of a uh, change in the in the uh, subgroup uh, slopes so this is what that what that difference looks like. And if you think of like, okay, you're starting from 1910, you're getting all the way to 1940, you can think about, okay, what happens if, if the slopes don't change at all? You just have the convergence in levels between blacks and whites. You get almost 50% of the way there, um, you know, depending on how you do it. You can do, you, we get somewhere between, between uh, you know, 25 and, and 50%. Um, and, then, and then when you only change the white slope, you get sort of you know um, another uh, you get the rest. It's like fifty percent plus um, of the of the um, of the uh, uh, of the gap is driven by the of by the white slope only. And then when you put them both together, you get almost all the way with this uh, with the with the with the purple bar. So we think it's like okay, you know, black, just racial inequality is contributing a lot to like the, uh, the improvement in overall equality of opportunity here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so for the last thing I'll talk about is uh, just the reversal of the gender cross race uh, differences in, in time. So a quote unquote well documented fact uh, is that uh, in that it was done in a paper in 2019. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, black men are worse off from than black women for the same father's income. Uh, um, and uh, and so that's sort of like sort of seen as it's motivated a lot of policy concern about the outcomes for 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 black men in particular. So lower educational attainment, uh, higher rates of incarceration, lower life expectancy, lower employment, lower earnings. So so black men are doing worse than black women on all of these outcomes in, in contemporary data. Has this always been the case? Uh, uh, and did these differences exist in earlier cohorts? So this is the contemporary data. This is, um, uh, you know, black black female is the blue, black male is the is the green. You can see for every level of parents' income, uh, 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 black black women are doing better than black men. Um, you might wonder, oh, is white female actually higher than white male? But this is household income rank. So it's like pooling uh, uh, their the the male and female uh, incomes. Um, and so we can look at this uh, historically, and um, and so you see there's there's uh, in this you know for women you can see that you know uh, th there's uh, white women are, are are richer than 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 black women, but black women experience a, a big increase in their absolute level. This is their 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 rank here. In this uh, in this period, while white women experience a flattening of the of the of the slope, and then we can see that for men the convergence is much uh, uh, larger. So if you look at the the levels here, you can see this is the the intercepts for the men are around four, 30 to 40. The intercepts for the black women are like 20 to 30. So black women are just you know a lot worse off uh, uh, than black men. Uh, in this period, and so that suggests that there's like a uh, there's definitely a case in which there's been this reversal, and that black women were doing better than black men uh, in the current period, but black men were doing a lot better than black women in the historical period. Um, and one uh, one of the things we talk about in the papers the, that we find just intriguing is the role of of widowhood in driving this. So it's like it turns out these 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 women. Are much higher widowing rates in the 1910 to 1930 period because black male life expectancy is so low. 
So you're just seeing a lot of like missing men in the uh, in the uh, in the black population, and so that shows up as like a very high widowhood rate for 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 black women, and that keeps their household incomes low. And so some of this convergence is just coming from the appearance of 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 black men in the surviving to the point that they're, that that they're uh, uh, in increasing the income of they're contributing to household income. Okay, I'll conclude with that. Um, so the takeaways from this, um, social mobility is not necessarily fixed. The United States has indeed successfully increased full cohort mobility between 1910 and 1940. Um, uh, the, and it looks like, like racial convergence and absolute income seems to be a key contributor to increased in, intergenerational mobility in, uh, in, in, US, in, in US history. Um, assortative marriage and selection into marriage and selection into child raising, which I, which I hadn't talked about so much uh, uh, today, is stable but not obviously uh, um, uh, increasing contributor to intergenerational persistence. And so, just to, to tie it back, I think it's like where, you know, I wanted to present this paper because it was like, okay, here's how these contributions of identity-based inequality kind of have a very natural connection to like socialist ideas of equality of opportunity. And so you might want to have to think about equalizing in an absolute level these differences, uh, particularly by race, if you want to sort of make progress towards realizing uh, equality of opportunity, which is traditionally defined in a, in a group neutral way. And I'm done. Thank you, Suresh. Now we're going to take questions. Not all at once. Not all at once, yeah. <laughs> Ah, Giacomo. You're on mute, Giacomo. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So for presenting a, a huge material, uh, empirical material in a, such a, a short period of time. So I, I have a couple of uh, questions about uh, um, the data so in order to uh, understand better what uh, you presented to us. So three points. The first one is about the income concept. So uh, what about, is this a, a pre-tax or a post-transfer and tax? Uh, are um, uh, employer benefits, health, uh, pension benefits included or excluded? And household income is, is uh, not equivalent uh, income or is, so this is the first question. And the second one is that I guess that you have a measure of uh, a transitory income. I don't know whether a monthly or weekly or yearly income. And um, there is an age gradient. And this age gradient, uh, empirically, we know that it is uh, highly dependent on the educational level. And uh, across cohorts, educations uh, have changed uh, dramatically. So how, if this is the case that you have a, not a lifetime measure of income, but a transitory measure, uh, how have you handled the problem of uh, uh, of uh, varying uh, age gradients. And the third one <clears throat> is that, uh, um, if I understood correctly, you always take father's uh, income as the starting point in order to measure the intergenerational uh, mobility. But uh, again, in terms of, uh, uh, in ter in terms of the uh, relative uh, contribution of a father's income to family income, I guess that because of the secular increase of women participation, this has changed a lot. Uh, if one compares courts uh, uh, born in the 10s, uh, 20s uh, with courts born uh, uh, after the Second World War, huh? so that uh, maybe uh, uh, there is uh, much less information about uh, family income, um, looking at father's income uh, for the younger courts as a uh, compared to the older cohorts. Um, got it. So let me let me take the, the, the question. So uh, this is all pre-tax income. So it's uh, it's like the household income pre-tax, not equivalized. Um, we're working on trying to get the number of kids 
in a in a in a household that you'd need to to equivalize it. Um, so I think we get over the transitory stuff because we we only look at respondents between the ages of 30 and 50. So basically, like the peak of the life cycle earnings for everyone is like happening somewhere in that 30 to 50 range. So where you see the divergence by education is in the early 20s. Uh, uh, period because like you you get a, you know people that take a little bit longer in school and then they like experience a really fast uh, 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 wage growth in the 20s so by looking at the 30 to 50 range in our in our outcome you know only looking at respondents in the 30 to 50 range we think we're getting uh, we're, we think we're getting households like close to their peak earnings um, and uh, uh, and so that's how we handle the and, the and then within that Suresh we also control for H and H squared and then uh, we are doing rank year yeah so you know, we think we're pretty good on that. We could be more flexible and think about age by age squared interacted with education or something like that. But there's not like a ton of years in that that we're grabbing. Yeah. So I think I think we're we're doing like as uh, I think we're doing okay on the life cycle on the life cycle component, particularly because the results look pretty similar, regardless of whether you do it by rank, which is like rank within age and like the, these the this this uh, this IGE measure, on the uh, on the second set of questions so I, I agree that like with if you sort of thought that um, marriage was random so for then then uh, like in the sense of like or was scrambling the information in father's income so that then that would mean that basically as you start marrying into uh, as women start entering the workforce then you start seeing you know father's income becomes less predictive of of, 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 of kids income. Um, but I think if anything, like when you look at this IGE measure, you kind of see it, it's coming back up. So father's income is becoming more predictive of, uh, of, of household income, you know, in the, in the, in the log income sense as you, uh, uh, in, 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 in recent cohorts. Also so, talk about more directly answering your question, what we've done in a, we didn't show it here, but what we've done in a recent robustness check. So we should say like we take the family income in the census so we are including everybody's income we're just predicting it with dad's with, with dad's occupation and race and region um but we've taken you know so we can take the 19 you know 40 um census for the earlier kids and then the 1950 census for the later kids and the 1960 census for the later kids so that 1960 census should be reflecting the family incomes of families where moms are working so we are sort of picking that up we, we didn't show that today so it's a totally fair question but that's right that's another nice yeah. um reason for doing that robustness check we hadn't thought of that as a as the reason to do it thank you Colin, do you want to ask a question? It's me. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, there was somebody talking to me here, so I couldn't really hear the, uh, the last response. So maybe you have already uh, responded to this, but do you, do you account for inequality changes over time? And of course, then uh, to the social mobility, when inequality goes up, that's uh, different from uh, social mobility if inequality goes down. Uh, do you count for these things over time? Yeah, so this uh, is why we show these two measures, the rank rank and the okay. and the intergenerational elasticity. And so the in some sense it's like, you know, the pure movement among rungs in the ladder versus how far away the rungs in the ladder are. And so the intergenerational elasticity is picking up how far away the rungs in the ladder sorry. are. The rank rank is picking up like where do you sit in the in the in, in the ladder. And so and so it's in, it's interesting that those two have started to diverge in the in the recent cohorts. Um, can I ask a question? Um, could you, could you, could you, Suresh and Ileana, spell out the policy implications of your findings, in particular in terms of what, how it relates to other proposals that have been made so far by Thomas and others? What, yeah, so I think we're we're still. I mean, I'm sure we're still like we're. Uh, I was thinking about adding something about that, but then I was like, ah, we don't really know at this point. So I think you know, uh, our candidates are kind of things like the expansion of education. It's like no surprises, right? It's like the expansion of education. Civil rights movement. <laughs> Sorry, what? The labor movement. Civil rights movement. I mean, one of the things that we've been looking at is trying to understand like why, you know, did that black mobility um, graph just, you know, go up in levels? And, you know, it's it was like, oh, it's people moving to the north. And actually it's just in a decomposition sense, like we don't know what's causal, but no, it's actually the people in the south doing better, uh, which is, 
you know, consistent with the time, the timing is consistent with the civil rights movement. Um, yeah, and I think Suresh, like one thing that, you know, we need to focus on next is like, why did the white, why did the white line start flattening? Because that's also a very important point. And we suspect just based on the timing that it could be the high school movement, the mass uh, expansion, you know, where high school became a regular thing in the US, but we can do a bit more to reject, um, to see if we can reject that hypothesis, but that would be our best guess at the moment. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing that I didn't show it, but one of the things that we have is that while the correlation between father's income and high school like declines kind of continuously, yeah. the correlation between father's income and college has actually been increasing. So college, uh, college is now like more correlated with father's income. Um, and so if you had to think of like what an education policy would look like, you'd want to like kind of drive down that correlation between father between father's income and college uh, and college attendance. And you could imagine that massive like free college would would do that. And so you no, know, I mean, we've been thinking about just to pick up on Thomas uh, graph when he was showing the decline in per pupil decline in education and then even more dramatic per pupil spending. I mean, the US is such a great example of that. Um, you know, from the 1980s onward, just like the share of the tuition that the kid is expected or their family is expected to play is pay has just gone up tremendously. So does that does that um, does that help you take a position on the student debt cancellation debate, like especially as it affects differentially blacks and whites? I mean, I, th I feel like that's a symptom of a larger problem of, of under public provision. So it's like, you know, we've like rationed the supply of education and then we say we're going to give you a, a subsidized loans to get it. And so everyone goes into debt to get into this fixed supply. And it's really like not, you know, if you just wanted like public spending on education and just, you know, <laughs> just increase slots. Um, I feel like the student debt cancellation like fixes a symptom of this like undersupply of education. But really the problem is like the undersupply of the public education. Um, yeah, I mean, if I had to pick one, I would pick as much as I think it's terrible, I do think that, you know, people who have a lot of debt are kind of victims of a really shitty system. But I, I just think the most, you know, the most logical thing is to start expanding the supply instead of juicing up the demand with these loans that, you know, we know people are not good at figuring out, 18 year olds are not good at figuring yeah. out, you know, what their lifetime, you know, debt obligations are going to be. Yeah, sorry, I do this because I'm like inelastic dimness of a supply curve. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the US has done nothing in terms of like expanding seats at public universities outside of a few examples, like in California. Um, you know, that's just been going in backward. If anything, you're you're ex you're asked to to cover more of a fixed supply. I don't see any other questions. Maybe I'm wrong, but if if, if there are no more questions, um, no other question, I just have one more, which is that your assumption is that if you increase the supply of education, um, I don't know, it's going to reduce the costs of an education or something like that. But I, that my understanding is that the cost of an education is not affected by I, I don't know. There's something fixed about the face-to-face, -face, you know, teaching that makes salaries really. I don't know. I just I, th I thought this was not as um, solvable through supply. That this was something that had to do. That, that yes, maybe you can create scarcity and, and increase the tuition, but there's, there's a floor for how low you can go with the tuition fee. No? Is that wrong? I mean, I think we can, we can, we can, we can make it zero if we wanted to and just subsidize it. Um, oh, yes, through state so, subsidies. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. There is state okay. subsidies, right. yes. Of course, there'd be state subsidies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not like a free market or. Um, okay, that's, that's like, right. yeah. But the U.S. Okay. hasn't yeah. even seen a totally pernicious effect of this is that the U.S. hasn't, we've just sort of made a decision, we're not going to be expanding seats at public universities or we do so very slowly. And so what's happened as you've juiced demand through these um, student loans is that these very pernicious, um, predatory, private, for-profit schools have filled the need. Um, and I'm sure there are some exceptions that are useful, but in general, the studies have shown that they're really bad. They, they suck in all this aid and then they have very low graduation rates. And so um, it's just a straight, I mean, the U.S. has the same, the U.S. in some ways has the same view on healthcare, reduce demand with, you know, to, with premium subsidies. And then we do nothing in terms of, you know, having public hospitals, you know, all of that's done to the private sector. So it's kind of like, what do you expect? Yeah, although I want to point out there's also a way in which education, so there's this recent paper by Heckman and uh, Landmore, and uh, sorry, and 
I forget the other co-author, but there, where they argue that that Denmark's low intergenerational uh, elasticity is kind of fake because when you look at educational correlations in Denmark, they're actually pretty high, and so you know highly educated uh, uh, parents have kids with more with with more education, and then they argue that and, and which is sort of weird. But then when you look at income gaps, they're like much less they're much less correlated than the U.S. And you might think that you know I wouldn't be surprised if that remains true in in this period in the U.S. That like you might keep educational correlations. Uh, you know, might not fall nearly as much as income correlations because there's a raw compression thing that happens that basically means that you can, by, by reducing the differences in income among kids, you just kind of are able to increase income mobility, even if you're not necessarily changing the underlying like educational mobility as, as much. Um, um, there's a comment in uh, by one of the audience members, I think. So uh, I th what I think I can unmute this person and maybe she can just uh, I don't know what to find her so that's a problem Arlene. okay I'm very sorry I don't know nope, nope, she's here or I just I just there. granted uh granted the ability to talk oh great thank you so if um this person wants to speak up and I get are you asking for me yes it's yeah. me <laughs> well, hello. Great presentation. This whole program has been really super. But I think that the correlation that you draw between an improved uh, improvement in economic circumstances and the willing to engage in political protests, particularly as Americans, African Americans, is very. And I've always felt, ever since uh, reading Clinton's Anatomy of Revolution, that there is a definite correlation between economics and politics and revolutionary activity. People who are starving to death can't afford to revolt. They have to have something in their bellies in order to have the courage to stand up and say no. And by the 1960s, uh, African-Americans after two world wars and uh, the effect of the great migration, which Isabel Wilkerson talks about in her book, um, had begun to have an impact and at that point, they started to get politically involved. There's a great vignette in uh, Ms. Wilkinson's book about a woman who moved to Chicago uh, from uh, Mississippi, um, started to do a little bit better, bought a house with her family, and then for the first time in her life, voted. <laughs> she was amazed that she could actually vote in Illinois. That's what happened. Thank you. Uh, there's also a question. You feel free to answer the question and reply to the comment by Zach Davidson. And then that's the last question we're going to take, I think. Uh, Zach, do you want to ask your question? If not, I'll just read it. Um, how far does how far back does administrative data go? For example, analysis by Chetty, etc. Are there opportunities, sources to take this conversation and research back into the 19th century? Yeah, I, so you want to go? Oh, sure, yeah. So for the actual IRS data, there's no way of doing any kind of analysis over time on intergenerational relative mobility, which is the concept we're talking about. You can basically look at 1980. Um, if you just think about it, in 1980, those people are 40 now. And so if you're trying to always get around age 40, um, you can't go anything beyond um, 1980. And uh, anything before 1980, you don't have data on their parents because uh, the administrative data began in the 1990s. So there's no way of using those like really great, you know, tons and tons of data and precision uh, data source to go back in, in time. There's a lot of historical work that just looks at occupation. Uh, a good reference there would be Joe Ferry. Um, and they're almost always looking at white men because if you wanna go further, you know, further back, how do you think about slavery as an occupation? And those kind of decisions are so, so difficult. So that literature pissed pretty much just looks at white men. There are a few exceptions um, that I'd be happy to you know, talk about offline. But uh, uh, yeah, so they're basically using occupational status as it um, translates from father to from white father to white son. Okay, well, we are now out of time, I believe officially. So John, uh, do you wanna conclude the, the day or should we just say goodbye and see you tomorrow? Um, well, people can stick around on the on, uh, I think Isabel and I are going to talk about something, but otherwise, I don't have any instructions. 
just to meet tomorrow at uh, at 10 o'clock and in the morning session. Well, I don't, it's, I'm not sure who's going to be chairing it. We'll see you then. Great. See you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thank you for the comments. Bye. Bye.